Great, we're very glad that you are here. I'm Diane Zimmerman. I'm the director of the National Center for the Study of University Engagement, which I always say quite slowly. <laughs> we're part of the uh, Office of the University of Outreach and Engagement here at MSU. A, a number of you were here this morning. At least I trust that you were. Um, if you weren't, you're missing a great presentation and workshop by our speaker, Dr. Kelly Ward and Tammy North, who were here this morning. Um, and then we had a great lunch together, and then there were some afternoon sessions as well. But we're very pleased that you are here. We have a, a topic that is a little different than this morning's topic. So this afternoon, we're going to be talking about uh, managing work and family, on which Kelly has also done a great deal of research. I am going to be asking Ann Austin, professor in our Higher Adult and Lifelong Education program, to actually come in a minute and introduce Kelly. Uh, we've asked Ann. She is the first distinguished chair of the Mildred, Dr. Mildred B. Erickson uh, Chair in Higher Adult and Lifelong Education. And then Ann is a, life, a longtime friend of Kelly's and a longtime friend of ours as well. Uh, so welcome to you. A uh, comment about Ann for me. Oh, okay. The best exemplar I know of the ability to manage work and family with <laughs> discipline, <laughs> love, and graciousness. <laughs> and please come and introduce. I couldn't imagine what she was going to say. I was just getting comfortable thinking this is going to be very nice. I get to relax. I don't have to say much. What I, I was just on the phone with someone who was inviting me to come speak at another campus, and I said, the person was suggesting the date, and I said, you know, I've got to check with my husband because, I don't know if you know my husband, we never travel at the same time because for 20 years we've been raising children. And then in the middle of my sentence I said, actually, I probably don't even need to ask him because our two final children, who are twins, are graduating and they won't be around next fall. <laughs> so I thought, my goodness, I don't have to do as much checking as normal. Well, thank you, Diane, very, very much. This is a delight for us to have um, Kelly Ward with us today. Some of you did get to meet her this morning, but I appreciate Diane's invitation for me to introduce her this afternoon uh, because she has been a professional and personal friend for some time. I think we met probably 15 years ago or so. Um, so we've known each other for quite a long time. Our personal lives parallel in some ways, and our professional interests have, our research interests have um, crossed and touched also. Let me tell you a little of the official things about Kelly. She is an associate professor. She's at Washington State University. Uh, she's a professor of higher education in the Department of Educational Leadership and Counseling there. Uh, previous to her time there, she was on the faculty and also in administrator at the University of Montana and she worked with Campus Compact there some time ago and she also was at Oklahoma State University. Another point of connection we had because my own career a number of years ago uh, also began at Oklahoma State University. Uh, Kelly also, I think many of you will be interested, has been very involved nationally. In particular, I wanted to mention her uh, involvement in a variety of leadership roles with the Association for the Study of Higher Education, which some of the people here attend regularly. She's also been involved in other associations, but that one in particular I wanted to mention. Uh, her research interests are distinctive and um, build on each other. She is a person, I think, who clearly has several areas with clear research trajectories where she's carved out uh, particular areas of expertise and where she sought for her expertise. Uh, this morning, uh, many of us were able to uh, interact with her and hear her thoughts regarding um, engagement. Her work uh, for a long time has focused on the university's mission as it relates to service and engagement. As I mentioned, she's been involved in Campus Compact. She's very interested in issues of service learning. She's interested in university community partnerships. Uh, and a lot of her writing and work has focused on faculty roles and how faculty members can organize their work so that uh, it reflects a commitment uh, to engagement. And she's written about how to do that, how exemplars do it, and how to think about some of the uh, reward issues that relate to that in faculty work. Another area where she's written and made very nice contributions pertain to new faculty and ways to socialize and support new faculty, which is very important because we're seeing more and more uh, retirements and new faculty coming into the university who need to, to learn uh, how to 
fully and productively engage in their work. She's also been involved in her teaching and in her research in areas pertaining to student affairs and multicultural teaching and learning. So you can see she has a, a range of interests, but they all relate uh, very nicely. What we're focusing on, of course, this afternoon is a particular stream of her work, a really productive stream of her work, uh, that pertains to issues around work and family, or work and personal commitments. Uh, Kelly has been one of the leaders in this area nationally, conducting research in this area. One of the terms she may speak about today, um, that she and her colleague Lisa Wolf Wendell, and other colleagues, some of us in this room know, uh, I think probably coined, is the term academic mothers and academic motherhood. Um, and I think we see that now in the research and the literature in various places. I believe Kelly and her colleague Lisa are the originators of that. Uh, Nowadays, I think many of us know uh, many universities, including our own, are very actively looking at ways to support both men and women who are uh, committed to both uh, productive and rich personal lives as well as productive and rich professional lives. Um, and that often means for universities and colleges the challenge of thinking about what kinds of policies and practices will best support faculty members so they can manage the different dimensions of their lives in satisfying and productive ways. And um, Kelly's work, I think, really helps us think about the reason we would want to think about that issue and some of the ways that we could think about it. Uh, finally, in addition to highlighting, well, before, actually before I finish highlighting your professional work, I wanted to draw your attention to the short bibliography I saw at the end of the handout that I think many of you picked up as you came in. Because uh, it certainly does not include all of the many um, publications that Kelly has, but in particular there's one under her name that I particularly wanted to direct you to in uh, the Review of Higher Education. Uh, th that's the academic, I didn't bring it up here with me, academic mothers. Uh, that's a very nice article. Um, you'll also see several others there. There's a new book um, that she has some chapters in on gendered issues in higher education. You might wish to seek those publications out in particular. And then finally, I just wanted to, to uh, let you know about a few little personal things. Kelly herself um, is an exemplar of the challenge of having a very productive, satisfying professional and personal life. life. Uh, during the years that I've known her, she's moved from being a graduate student through the academic ranks uh, to achieving tenure and continuing um, her career. And also during that time, um, she has had three children. So and I just said to her now, is the oldest around six? And one always thinks of children as younger than they are. But I think you said the oldest is now, did you say seven or nine? Nine. 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 Uh, so she has three children uh, and a very active professional life also. So she certainly exemplifies what she's helping us to know about. I am delighted that she could come and be with us. I'm awfully glad all of you could spend a little time this afternoon, and we thank you very much for being here. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to um, start out just by talking about how this topic came about for me. Um, Partly because there was an article in the Chronicle where they referred to people who have babies in higher ed as breeders. So I'm a breeder because I had three kids. Um, but my initial interest in this topic actually came about from um, when I was a graduate student, I had looked at uh, attrition for junior faculty. And um, the research that was produced in the 80s and early 90s about junior faculty was a pretty negative, um, we, we, we refer to it as a peril and doom kind of literature that talked about salary inequities, um, chilly climates, and other types of inequities in the workplace. And I, didn't wanna, I don't want to deny that that existed at the time and still exists, but I remember going to sessions and thinking it seems like the field is changing, however, the, if, when we talk about faculty life, um, there's a tendency to focus on the negative a little bit. And I, I, I find that, I was starting to find that problematic because as a person who was actually working in the profession, I had really felt like, um, you know, it's the last best job, really, if you think about it. I mean, what else would we rather be doing as we're sitting there sort of lamenting the woes of faculty life? So, um, and I also um, 
really started to feel like looking at junior faculty issues is important because, as, as Anne mentioned, there is this big um, turnover in retirements. And um, actually, one of the sessions that Anne did in her research on graduate students, um, there was she put up pictures that students had drawn that depicted how they felt about academic jobs. And one of was um, the person going off the building. It was a little stick figure. And actually, I can draw it because it's it stuck with me. You know, it was this. And it was a stick figure, and I think there was traffic yes. looking down, and you know it was sort of like so that's a pretty pretty troubling visual with regard to how people were thinking about the academic profession, and looking at um, you know I'm not sure if this is something that I want to do, so we're really saying it's it's a form of personal suicide to go into an academic career, which I thought. Geez, that's, that's a troubling notion. And so um, I also was feeling like in terms of, we talk a lot about diversity in the academic pipeline and in faculty positions. And if we really want to have the best, brightest, most talented workforce, we need to think about people coming into that profession who might have multiple interests, that they might not just want to be an academic, but they in fact might want to have other interests as well. And then also, um, I think that the academic environment is a unique one that calls for thinking about work and family in a little bit of a different way because the academic, the tenure clock ticks simultaneous to the very ending of a woman's biological clock. So the average age for um, earning the PhD is um, 35, the, the average age of moving into a tenure track position. So if you take six years, that's 41. So that's really the end of when a woman um, has f her, the last of her fertility if she hasn't had children already. And the, the original wisdom was to wait until after you had tenure to think about having a child. So those different things started making me think about, hmm, you know, what, what is it that we might be able to find out about work and family? Because certainly the word on the street was it's, da it's dangerous territory to enter into an academic career and wanting to have a child or wanting to have an outside interest. I know that you know, when I was a graduate student and on the weekends, if I went skiing or something, you know, they'd be like, don't tell anybody. <laughs> and I'd say, well, Pat Terenzini, he's an accomplished skier. He was on the ski, ski team at Dartmouth. Of course I'm going to tell him. Like, no, they won't think you're serious. So, and, you know, never mind having a baby. That really was an indication of not being serious. And the, the, leader, the literature about um, faculty sort of affirmed that. It affirms that the academic profession is one that's greedy. It, it calls for total allegiance. And also, motherhood is a greedy institution and calls for total allegiance, especially from women. And so um, I went into this also with the notion of um, academic work never ends, unlike other professions. I, mean, I, I literally right now could work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I would, I would still have more to do. So I think, well, why bother? If I still have more to do, I might as well work less. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> But it is, it is, there is the idea out there that you have to, there's always more to do, always another book to read, always another paper to grade, always another paper, you know, project to conceptualize. So those things from the literature helped shape um, my thinking as I ventured into this project. So um, in 2000, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation was looking at work and family across different fields. They have s numerous initiatives at campuses throughout the country in different independent research centers looking at work and family. And then they had this small cluster of funding available to look specifically at work and family issues within the academic workplace. And so uh, my colleague Lisa Wolf and I had applied for a grant from the Sloan Foundation initially to look at um, women faculty at research universities. So because we were both tenure track faculty at the time, we did the research university study and then paused, wrote that up, thought, about a larger project. And then we, you know, so much of the research is done by faculty at research universities about other faculty at research universities. And recognizing that that's only a small part of the academic workplace, we then went on to interview um, 30 women at liberal arts colleges, 30 at community colleges, and 30 at regional and comprehensive institutions. So collectively, that comprises the first phase of this study, which I'll tell you about some of those findings. Um, the second phase of this project is we interviewed, um, we looked at the departmental context. One of the major findings 
is, um, and this actually relates also to what I was talking about this morning with engagement, it's really at the department level where faculty life is brokered, so to speak. So even if we have really progressive institutional climates, it really depends on the actual department. And so we then went on to interview um, faculty members with children and without, senior, junior, and department chairs in six different departments. And now the part of the project that I'm involved in is um, funded by the American Association for University Women, their educational foundation. I'm now doing a follow-up study to look at the ongoing impact of work and family because um, not only does academic work never end, but parenthood doesn't end. And I, I think the pinch really for women is in the early phase of childhood and the early phase of um, parenthood. And I really wanted to look at the physical aspects of pregnancy and childbirth. But I also now want to know, because there's really concerns about women in the pipeline. We've done pretty good, you know, in a lot of campuses. You know, at WSU last year, 43 of incoming faculty were women. So they're feeling pretty good about that. That's really variable by discipline. But at the associate level, it's 30%. And then at the senior level, it's 20%. And that's just that hasn't changed much. So the idea is that if 43% are new, then we're automatically going to see that progression to the senior level. And that actually has not happened. And I think part of the piece of that puzzle is work and family. So I wanted to know what's the ongoing impact of work de decisions in light of family and family decisions in light of work. So I, that's, the, that's where the project is right now. So um, what I want to do today is talk about some of the macro kinds of findings. I'm doing sort of a project summary. It worked out well. I was asked to do, uh, um, the Teachers College record has an online kind of current topics, current issues, and they wanted me to provide sort of a big picture of the findings. So it, it coincides nicely with this. So I can talk to you specifically about any aspect of the project, but today I wanted to highlight some of the major findings. And um, there's two kind of clusters to the findings, and sort of the individual level and what we found out from talking to individual faculty about their daily lives and their li lived experience. And then the more macro level, kind of looking at what implications these findings have for institutional policy and the institutions where people work. So um, to start, the first theme, looking at individuals, is timing. Timing is a really, really big preoccupation with regard to, um, for junior faculty in particular in terms of, you know, when's a good time to have a baby? And there really isn't a good time to have a baby. There's probably not a bad time to have a baby either, but I get asked that every time I give one of these talks, someone comes up to me afterwards and says, when should I have a baby? And it's like, well, I don't know. One, one, it assumes that you can control that to the, mac, to the nanosecond, which, you know, it feels like a lot of times you can until you, sometimes, until you try. Um, so th that is a huge preoccupation and also, it was kind of an interesting, um, when we talked to department chairs, they do a lot of mentoring about timing, which I thought was really interesting. So when we, said to depart when we were asked department chairs sort of follow-up questions about timing, their advice to new faculty is not to have a child. If, you know, the, to wait a little bit. That it's not sort of recommended for the weak-willed to try um, having a baby in light of a tenure process. So this issue of timing is on people's minds. And also, um, if you follow work and family conversations in the Chronicle of Higher Education, timing is a big preoccupation. They always have a work and family um, article in May or June where they talk about the annual baby boom for people who do try to time their baby to coincide with summer. And then there was also one article in last, last year um, in upstate New York. I can't remember the name. I, I can't remember what college it was. One of the Sage colleges, I think. They had three faculty members at the same time who had a baby in a communications department. And that faculty member, that department chair thought, bad timing. You weren't thinking about me having to schedule classes. So this issue of timing is on people's mind. Um, and then one of the other things we found is actually people manage this pretty well. We went, I mean, I, I did go into this study initially finding out how is it that people manage work and family. And I was happy to hear that there's good news to this. When the overall tenor of our interviews were not ones of, um, you know, tears and bloodshed. The, the overall sense was it's actually a pretty good, good gig in terms of if you ha to work in a faculty position and have children. This was especially true for women at community colleges who in most instances had worked in another sector prior because if you've um, worked in the corporate environment 
where you're really more tied to a nine to five kind of schedule, for them coming into a faculty position, they thought, this is nothing. Or people who worked in the technology sector and then moved into, a community college, or into the community college setting, when you could compare being an academic to other settings, they say, why would anybody com complain about this? This is, it's great. In the middle of the day, if I need to, I can go to an appointment. I can schedule my classes. You know, usually once you work someplace for a while, you can schedule classes at days and times that you prefer. So they, they really saw that there was a good combination. One of the other things that we don't often talk about is um, this notion of buffering. You know, work really f buffers family. You know, being a mother is not all roses. It, it's a, it can be a very challenging enterprise. And we don't like to talk about how nice it is to leave your kids at home and go to work. You know, my husband was a stay-at-home dad for a long time, and I clearly had the better job because I'd be leaving him and crying, spit up. I'd be like, got to go to work. <laughs> and I'd go to lunch, and, you know, I worked hard, but I could also, I mean, my day was my own. When you're an academic, you really can carve out the day how you want it to be. Whereas for, as a parent, you know, it's pretty intense. So there is a buffering aspect. And the opposite is true, too. I interviewed some women who actually hadn't got tenure. They did not get tenure. I actually interviewed a woman, and she and her husband both didn't get tenure. And she said, thank God I had kids. Because that, that was a really intense period of life for a couple not to both not to have children, I mean, to, not, to not have tenure. And then having a child really buffers some of the realities of the workplace. And it really adds perspective, too. Because you have a bad day at work, and then you go home, and there's your cute cooing baby. And then you go, oh, yeah, OK. And there, there's no longer the ability to um, be consumed with work. And pretty much, um, the, we did learn about the consuming nature of the academic profession, and having a child adds quite a bit of perspective of that. One of the other things that we found um, is that the autonomy and flexibility afforded in academic work actually blends well with having a child. Um, and the, the flip side of that is that academic work does never end. It's something you can do at 4 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I, one of the questions we asked um, in the in initial interviews was to talk about daily life. And some people were getting up at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning, and then you, know, you work four hours before your kids get up, and then you have, get the kids off to school, and then you work at night. I mean, so people have really onerous schedules because you can read books any place, any time. And there was a lot of sneaking in of work. Um, almost to a person, People really, I, we asked a question about what their life was like before, what their academic life was like before children and after children. And almost to a person, people really had workaholic tendencies. I think the academic workplace fosters workaholism because you can do it all the time. And plus, we enjoy it. You know, when I'm sitting there reading a book about academic issues, it's not, I mean, sometimes I'm doing it because I have to, but I usually am really enjoying that. So it's not like other kinds of things that, you don't enjoy so, but the, it, it, it amounts to a lot of hours. And so um, that was a challenge, especially when you're a new parent, you're used to working all the time, suddenly you have a child and you can't work all the time. That creates a lot of tension. Um, and then one of the other findings was about unclear expectations. The academic workplace is sort of known for lack of clarity with regard to promotion and tenure. You know, what do I have to do? How many first tier, top tier journal articles do I have to have? Um, is it okay if things are collaborate, collaborative? You know, I got a grant, but this morning we heard about the need to have grants from certain kinds of venues. So there's a lot of ambiguity. And this was, in particular, the less clear an institution's mission, the more ambiguity that there is. So at regional institutions in particular, and what I would refer to as um, institutions that are trying to climb the academic ladder, a lot of times there's a real lack of clarity with regard to um, what expectations there are for tenure. And so um, this is an issue for all faculty, but it's in particular an issue for new faculty and then also if you're a new faculty member, plus you add a child to the mix. Again, when you can't work all the time, there's an anxiety associated with watching everybody else work all the time to sort of accomplish the goals that seem uncertain and then at 5 o'clock, you have to go home because you have to go be a mom. So um, that un those unclear expectations, it, it seemed to be magnified for this particular group. Um, and then one of the other findings um, is fear. Well, Lisa and I wrote an article called The Fear Factor because we heard a lot about fear. Fear about having a baby. 
If I have a baby, will I be taken seriously? Fear about using policies. If I take time off, you know, am I going to miss something? Um, will I lose the ability to teach a particular class if I take time off? Fear about getting tenure. If I have a child, is it going to jeopardize my ability to get tenure? And then a real fear about not taking, not taken seriously. So if I um, have a child, is that an indication that I'm not taking my job seriously? So um, to switch a little bit to some perspectives on institutional environments, um, one of the um, out, the outcomes of, of people being fear, fearful about their jobs is also is about silence. And there was a big, cli big environment of don't ask, don't tell, don't instigate. And we're, we're familiar with that from the military policy. And silence is really golden when having a baby. And we were really interested in this because this is true for department chairs too. So I, one of the questions we asked department chairs, what kind of policies do you think should be available? So, and I was pleased with how progressive I felt department chairs were about what kinds of policies they felt should be available for um, not just for women faculty, but for all faculty having a child. So then I would, a follow-up question was, okay, you know, Mary Lou had a baby last semester. What kind of policies were available to her? Oh, we didn't talk about it. So it's like here we have this call for policy, but then they don't talk about policy. And then the same was true for Mary Lou. She wouldn't mention it a lot of times. Either. So we were surprised at how little was known about the policy environment. So a lot of times we even ha we had the policies in hand and then we would ask department chairs and we asked faculty about what policies were available and we were pretty surprised at what people did not know about their own policy environment. There was a real assumption that whatever was available I wouldn't use or wouldn't be helpful so I didn't even look. I was a majority of people were not aware of the policies available on their own campus which I thought was a very interesting finding and that I think that is um, one of the, a consequence of fear. So um, again, when someone has a child, there's sort of the pleasantries associated with having a child in terms of we had a shower, we had a party, um, but in terms of actually having a conversation about policy, how are we going to cover your classes, pretty much what happens is the individual woman comes up with a plan. So, um, you know, so-and-so is going to cover my classes for those two weeks, you know, I probably can get back into the classroom right away. I mean, people are back in the classroom. It is scary. There was one woman on the way, she taught human development, so she wanted her students to see her baby. On the way home from having a baby, she stopped in at her class. You know, so on the one hand, you think, oh, that's kind of neat. But on the other hand, you think, that's sick. You know, that this, this idea that you're right back at work. So, um, and that was pretty prevalent. People take off and really Lisa, Lisa Wolf Wendell, my colleague, she's like, I'm not proud of it, but I was back there a week later. And, you know, I felt pretty good after I had a baby. I was up and running. I mean, that's not always the case. So you kind of thought, well, I guess I could teach my class because it is a pain to cover classes. Covering classes is the biggest obstacle here because you can read, you can write, get into research right away, but the physical aspect of covering classes and going to meetings is the most challenging. And covering classes, is, it, it's the biggest pain for department chairs. I mean, that's kind of what they say they have to cover and that's what individual faculty they come up with these pretty elaborate plans they then present the plan to a department chair for sort of a nod on how to take care of that so faculty go to great lengths to make it work and um, Bob Drago and Carol Kolbeck do work family research at Penn State and one of the things they talk about is bias avoidance that people um, go to great lengths to avoid bias so one of the ways that they do that is through having their baby in, in, off, in the academic off season, as I call it, so either at summer or Christmas time. And then also um, uh, coming up with strategies so that they'll be the, it'll have the least possible impact on the department. So that's one of the ways that people avoid, they anticipate that there's going to be bias and the way they avoid it is to not make waves. Um, one of the other findings at the institutional level is related um, at the department level. So regardless of how progressive an institutional policy might be, it really is brokered at the departmental level. And so um, the department chair and senior colleagues are really key in terms of how people feel about taking leave and what leave opportunities they feel are available. And so, um, and this is particularly important due to the uncertainty of the um, policy 
environment, the department chair is really the person that communicates, here's what's available, here's what the options are, here's how, what, how other people have handled it. And so um, it's really at the department level where the concern lies. So they're kind of our um, big findings at both the individual and institutional level. So, um, you know, I always ask my students, so I always pose the question to myself, which is, so what? And now what? So some of the policies that we've been calling for and thinking about at the institutional level is one is um, campuses really need to have more than the Family Medical Leave Act. And uh, we were surprised at the number of campuses. And when you ask department chairs, well, we're covered by FMLA, which basically says you're automatically granted 12 weeks of unpaid leave with the event, with the event of a family event. So if, if you have a child or if you need um, dependent care, elder care, different family events. But, you know, it's unpaid. And 12 weeks, you know, some people say 12 weeks, pretty good. But if, in terms of how, depending on when you have your child in relationship to the semester, it can cut across in sort of an awkward kind of way. So campuses really need to think more than, beyond, than just having FMLA. It's, a, it's an important safeguard to have there. But what ended up happening is once FMLA came into place, a lot of campuses set up, you know, we're covered. We actually have a pretty good policy, but we, we need to have more than that. Um, one of the things we recommend when it's possible is to think in terms of a 16-week leave, if there's a 16-week semester. And that might not be a total leave, but with regard to teaching. Um, one of the other suggestions, of course, when possible, is to have a paid leave. And the, the campuses that have paid leaves, people use them a lot more, as you might imagine. Um, and there was a lot less anxiety associated with using policies if paid leave was available, although that's you know, sort of limited to the most um, wealthy of campuses. Um, another suggestion is to have stop clock policies be automatic. Most campuses, um, you can apply to stop the tenure clock for all different kinds of reasons. If you have a hard time getting your lab started, um, if you have a child, if you get sick, if someone in your family get sick, um, if you've had technology problems, I mean, you can apply for it. But one of the things that campuses are starting to do now is as soon as you basically indicate, add your child to your insurance that your tenure clock process stops automatically. There's some controversy associated with that. But what that does is it takes away from the junior faculty member having to ask permission of a senior departmental chair. So that um, is one suggestion. Another is um, to offer part-time options for the short term. You know, we have this very either-or um, with regard to the tenure track that you're either full-time or that you're, or that you're, you're either full-time and on the tenure track or you're part-time and off the tenure track. And some campuses are starting to look at having part-time options for a, a short period of time, so that, say the year that you have a child, or if you have a child with complications. Um, which is not uncommon to happen, that you would have a part-time section in the tenure track, and then your, the tenure track would be extended for the amount of time that you were part-time. Another is um, having childcare available. As campuses are being more progressive, they're actually marketing themselves with having really good childcare opportunities available if they're available, because it's a big concern, especially in small places like Pullman, Washington. Um, we're sort of a captive community, and um, people, it's really hard to get infant care there. So people actually are discouraged sometimes for coming to Pullman. So camp, places like Pullman, they're a little behind the eight, eight ball in terms of having um, a lot of child care, infant care available. But campuses that do have strong infant care, they actually advertise and say that we give priority to faculty in, as a form of recruitment. Another is um, having modified duty options, and I think this is actually an easy policy to put in place. So to have um, maybe in one year, if, if you teach a 2-2 course load, perhaps you would teach a 1-1 course load and maybe pick up something in the summer that you might um, teach a class online instead of face-to-face. Um, -face. So thinking about how people's responsibilities can be modified early, um, a a soon after having a child. So sort of the overall institutional suggestion is that there needs to be an institutionalized policies, but there needs to be flexibility um, with having that. Um, some other policy considerations is how important it is with regard to recruitment. 
I think as work and family issues have become more on the table, and as campuses have become more progressive with having policies, they are using it as a way to recruit really um, quality faculty. And there are some campuses that where we interviewed, especially with regard to dual career couples, they're being really progressive about bringing couples in together and having um, spousal hiring. And so they're able to really bring in a much higher quality faculty than they would be otherwise. Um, one of the other policy considerations to think about is really adopting a life course perspective. You know, the tenure track is this really short period of time that unfortunately coincides with, you know, you're new, it takes a long time to get collaboration set up, and, you know, I understand and I, I see the utility of it, but sometimes it takes a long time. We talked this morning with regard to creating community partnerships. It takes a long time to sometimes get a research agenda established. And so I think we need to take, um, I mean, I, I'm not at all, someone has always, this one, um, one of my colleagues, Bill Tierney, who studies faculty things, he said, be careful what you're asking for there. And I'm not calling for um, the tenure should be done away with, but I think we need to think about the whole faculty career in a slightly more rhythmic way. I feel like right now it's sort of out of the chute and you go, 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 go until you get a lifelong parking permit, which happens when you're retired, right? So I think we need to have um, a more ryth rhythmic approach to that. So at certain periods of time um, that you would, there might be lulls in productivity, but at other times there would be spikes in productivity. I mean, I, I was talking to this one woman and she was saying, if I looked at it over the course of time, you know, my first three years here, I worked 80 to 90 hours a week. So if I take some time off now, it basically, you know, is evening out. But we don't see it that way. But I, I think that we should. Um, also, there's a lot more um, research being generated about policy and you know, a lot of the research on, that's done about higher education is underutilized. I know on our own, my own campus, where I'm, I'm actually familiar with the committee, when they started looking at work-life issues, they started from scratch. And it's like, oh, there's all these information, and I came and I, I, I gave a presentation and I talked about that. But a lot of times, we're, we're not building on the resources that already exist. Another thing is, um, to address this fear, there needs to be a lot more awareness of policies and to publicize policies so that everybody is available of, everybody is aware of what is available. So to have websites, a lot of campuses now through their human resources unit will have um, a, a section on the web that's called work life, um, work family balance or a work life person who makes um, available and makes aware what the policies are and then also just what's available in a particular community with regard to um, child care and summer camps and that type of thing. Um, one of the other things I think we need to do is we need to um, normalize more having a child. I think right now, if you have a child, it's really, it's still sort of this taboo kind of thing in particular departments. And I think we just need to have the conversation more. And not that everyone's going to have, uh, not that every person in the department's going to have a child, or everyone, everyone is going to have one, but um, that we really need to bring these work and family issues out of the closet by having it be part of department chair orientation, new faculty orientation, graduate student orientations. And so um, that way if someone does have a child, it's part of the picture. It would also make it, I think, more inclusive for men and women. Right now, there's a danger. Um, I don't think we want to say that it's the same for everyone, that men and women both have children. And they, because they do, but I think we, we want to, stay aware that it is a gendered, that parenthood is a gendered phenomenon and it is experienced differently for men and women. So even though policies need to be available for both men and women, it's different if you've had the child and it's also different if you're the primary caretaker of the child. So we want to continue to, uh, and I'm still puzzling with how to frame this because I, we want to stay aware of gender but at the same time we want to be more inclusive of gender because um, <coughs> The second shift is alive and well. A lot of the women in the study really talked about that they still are doing a lot of the primary care of the child. So even if their husbands are supportive, that they're really doing the bulk of the child care, the anticipatory parenting and the emotional parenting. And so um, I think by having a more inclusive perspective, and this is true in all sectors, not just in higher education, it will bring men more actively into the parenting role but at the same time, we want to be aware of the differences that exist for men and women in that. So um, that's something 
that we need to pay attention to. Um, one of the other things is um, that one size fits all does not necessarily work. Again, it's important to have the policy available, but to be aware of um, meeting individual needs as well. So um, just to summarize, I think the future health and vitality of the academic workplace depends on a more holistic and healthy and transparent perspective on work and family. And um, there needs to be a greater synergy between the personal and the professional, of which family is part of. And I think um, in terms of having a more holistic work workplace, a more healthy workplace, that that will ultimately create a more productive, talented, and diverse faculty, which I think um, is in the best interest of higher education. So with that, I will turn it over to questions. In this very warm, late afternoon room. <laughs> Kelly, I don't have a, a question, it's more of a comment. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I run the Family Resource Center on campus, which is the work-life office mm. of the university that you spoke of. And, and it's really encouraging for me that you reinforce everything that we know to be true on the campus, the folks that have been working hard to change the climate and the culture, because that's so much what it is, and about mm -hmm. being at an individual departmental level whether the dean or the chair or the supervisor uh, make those recommendations. But I also like to emphasize, and I'm familiar with Bob Drago and his vice avoidance work, that um, it's important that we also look at, at the full lifespan approach because life happens and whether it's the birth of a baby or uh, an illness of a family member, we've got the elder care issues and you did mention about FMLA that we really need to attend to as well mm -hmm. because we can't plan for an elder care crisis when you have a child as you talked about with the timing, there's some, some planning that can go with that and that by the time they're 18, then you know you're pretty pretty uh, well there on their own. But elder care is, is a, a huge issue that's happening for the families as well. So mm -hmm. um, we, I think we need to, to continue to include that in part of the discussion. Mm -hmm. Because if you've got a mother who needs to go to her appointments because of her Alzheimer's, or your father fell and broke his hip in, in uh, Florida and needs to be moved in with you. There are times where people have to take time off work for a month at a time mm -hmm. to deal with elder care crises. So, and, and that's my emphasis here is that we're a, about life mm -hmm. and the, the personal work family wants. Right. That's also a burden that tends to fall more on women. Than exactly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave early. I have to pick up my daughter from soccer. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it is important to have a seat, but that's I think the men's issues really is a tricky one. Yeah. Because you either find that you're either totally misunderstood or treated like a champion when you mm -hmm. do kind of normal things. Uh, a question, did you find a difference between how women experienced uh, fear or bias based on the gender composition of the faculty? If it was a predominantly uh, a department or a school or unit that was mostly women, did that make a difference? Or if it was most, if you were one or two women in a department that was mostly men? Mm -hmm. So kind of looking broader at the, at the context of the department, how did that, or how would you think that that might affect some of your findings? Well, you know, women are really mean to other women. So, um, <laughs> you know, people talk about the sciences being um, more inhospitable to women, and we actually found the more collaborative nature of the sciences actually created um, a more hospitable environment. We, we, at one point we were talking about some of the departmental findings and we referred to new age departments. Because in the sciences, and this may just be the campuses that we went to, but we found that there was a lot more um, different kinds of configurations of people. One works a lot more collaborative. So if you were to be gone out of your lab, it, labs are tricky because they run on a 24-7 schedule in a lot of instances, which is very difficult for work family things. You also a lot of times can't bring a child to a lab. Like if I need to run into my office, I can bring my kids. Certain labs you you cannot bring a child. In certain buildings you can't bring a child into because of chemicals and that kinds of thing. So the lab part is hard, difficult. However, labs run in a whole system. So if, if the, the woman is in charge of the lab and leaves for a while, there's usually a whole stable of people behind you to help support that. So that actually helped, the collaborative nature of the sciences helps in this case. There was also a lot more configurations of scientists being married to other scientists um, and 
so it was a more family oriented environment in that regard in terms of having departmental retreats and parties there there seemed to be more family orientation to that but the the hardest people and this was kind of it the, the women, when we talked to them, they were saying the senior, a lot of times the senior women in departments had actually foregone having children. And those were the, a lot of times the people that were most critical of, you know, what's with the accommodation? You know, I did it and I didn't have any help. And so why are we bending over backwards to help these new people? You know, so the, I was actually surprised and dismayed because there's, there's been this idea that if we have more women, it's going to get better. But, um, the women were less charitable than with other women. The other thing we found is um, most of the department chairs were male in the, with the women that we interviewed. And a lot of times they actually had children who were dealing with work family issues. And that is something we found over and over again. So when you have a department chair who themselves has a lot of times if they're a grandparent and they actually are involved in their grandkids life, they actually have a more um, empathetic perspective because they're seeing their daughter or their son also navigating work and family kinds of things. So that was a, a big finding of the study. If the department chair sort of had a personal relationship to work and family, they actually could be a lot more sympathetic and understanding compared to if they did not. So there's very interesting gendered aspects to this for the whole department. I'm curious about, I think to me that she brought up, this issue of rhetoric. So work family, sometimes this is talked about work life, mm -hmm. how it's thought, of, thought about. In um, sort of the management literature, I know there was for a while a backlash in terms of, you know, do single people who have to, for, example, for whatever reason, you know, taking care of a parent or some other obligations that aren't sort of, you know, these that you're talking about is a bit, I don't know, is there a discussion policy-wise on campus or is this really about sort of the work family thing? Has that rhetoric evolved at all? If, I'm not sure if I'm being clear. Yeah, it has. I mean, what's your name? Lori. Lori? Like Lori mentioned, a work-life yeah. perspective. I mean, more, most of the offices are actually called work life because it is taking more of a life course yeah. perspective. And, you know, there there is... For a while, there was a bit of a backlash. You know, if you, I use the Chronicle as sort of my gossip column of higher education, right? So, you, so you follow the conversations. There was one just in last week, um, saying a letter to the editor saying, you know, we're hearing about there's these women um, in the sciences, six women who kind of are chronicling their careers. It's been going on. It's about two years now. They're called Generation X women. I can't remember, but they're in the career section, and. Um, they have sort of dispatches at periodic, periodic intervals. And um, somebody else wrote in saying, you know, I'm kind of sick of hearing about this work-life stuff. It's a personal choice. If you decide to have a child, you know, then you basically do so at your own, do it at your own risk, which is the prevailing wisdom in higher education. And, you know, when I read that, I do sometimes say, you know, yeah, there is a point being made there. And I think what's happened with the accommodation is there's sometimes people feel like, well, she's getting accommodation because she had a baby and now, you know, I'm having to pick up the slack or I'm having to work all the time. So I think what's happened is there's concern, people are concerned about going into the professorate not just because of work and family. I mean, this person that wants to jump, I don't know if that was because of work life. This is about the call to work all the time and to work all the time in very specific ways and so I think that's actually created it's opened up the rhetoric and that's what I, I mean I think this notion of opening up the rhetoric yeah. because there's many reasons why someone might desire or need a flexible right more flexible work schedule well also I mean what about just being like healthy interesting people who aren't exactly. consumed with work exactly. I mean god forbid we wouldn't want that to happen <laughs> I mean there's these terrible stories of you know the, my neighbor is like sings opera on the weekends and I've worked with him for 15 years and I never knew that. So that there's this real separation between work and life. And so I think it did start out with talking about work and family balance, but I'm seeing now that that's opening. In part, um, I think Anne's research has actually really done a lot to change and to open up that rhetoric because there is concern about people not wanting to go into the profession 
because of this perspective. One of the things we found in interviewing women who were not at research universities, one of the reasons they were opting, people were intentional about not wanting to work in the research university setting. Mm -hmm. And that they saw, you know, I want to be at a liberal arts college because I just graduated from MIT and that place is crazy. Those people work all the time and I want to have a life. And for them, part of that involved having a child. But also, you know, um, I play piano and I want to, you know, be in the choir at church or, you know, the, whatever it is. Right. So I think that has, that's kept the conversation moving on to have a more balanced life. And, and I think it's healthier. I mean, there's autoimmune deficiencies associated with um, work problems and, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing that we've had this workaholic tendency in higher education. So I think the larger conversation is really about that. It's about the culture giving permission for people to have a life outside of their job and right. not feel guilty about it, whether it's to do volunteer work, to take your dog to the vet, mm -hmm. it could be for your sibling who has MS, or, you know, it doesn't matter yeah. what the reason is, and that's the kind of flexibility an institution needs to provide. We shouldn't have to ask the question, why do you need that time? Yeah. We should know that people are grown-ups and, and they're in charge of themselves and they know how to get the work done, whether it's at 3 o'clock in the morning or that's the face time issue that's huge, too. Yeah. yeah. So if, I, if you're not at your desk, then you're not doing your work, which is not always the case. So. Right. Well, you know, academic organizations are total organizations where you can, um, and uh, mental institutions are as well, healthcare institutions are as well. You can, do, you can do everything you need to do on a campus. You can take a shower, you can eat, you can sleep. You really never have to leave if you think about it. And I'm not recommending it, but you can. <laughs> That's true at hospitals as well. It's true in mental institutions. You know, you live there. It's a 24-7 kind of cycle. And so I think what ends up happening is because you can do the work 24-7 and have all your needs met there, you know, in a lot of instances, the perspective is there's no need to leave. And I think it has really fostered this idea that you need to work all the time. You spoke this morning about uh, engaged. I missed it. I'm but um, about engagement with communities. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain amount of fear that goes mm -hmm. along with that. I was curious how these, is that fear amplified for somebody, for, say, for instance, a woman uh, dealing with a young child and approaching tenure? Or is there an opportunity in community engagement for greater flexibility? Um, I think a little bit of both. I mean, one of the things um, that in putting together these two talks, I actually started to see a lot of different overlap. I mean, my recommendations actually are really similar because people do scholarship regarding the, to the community on the sly as well. You know, people don't really understand it. A lot of times it goes unreported. It's amazing the kind of things people do in the community and they don't report it. I did a study a couple years ago on consulting faculty that do a lot of great work in the community through consulting and they never report it. And so, because it's like, well, it doesn't really fit, and I'm not sure if I should really be doing it, so I'm not going to report it. So I think, um, and that in part is associated with fear. So what we found, a lot of these things exist, unclear expectations, ambiguity, um, the, the call to work all the time, exists for everybody, uncertainty about engagement. But when you have, when you add a small child to the mix, also would be true if you add an ailing parent to the mix it amplifies whatever it is that's going on. So, um, you know, if, and that certainly would hold true with regard to engagement. However, at the same time, one of the things it can also do is create, um, there's ways, for example, to be involved if, in doing kinds of research in things that relate to what your child might be interested in in your community. So conceivably, there could be synergy in that regard. So that if you are, have your students involved in service learning projects, they could be in your child's school. So that there'd be a way that you'd be able to, maybe you yourself have a hard time getting into school to volunteer because you're working full time, but through your students' work, you could be involved. Or um, creating involvement for undergraduate students in different kinds of research projects that you might also be able to involve your children in. So I think in that way it can create synergy. Kelly, thank you so much. We appreciate it.
to invite you to continue the conversation with Kelly and with Tammy. We have a wine and cheese reception upstairs in the Carniche room. I think we can take you to the steps of the elevator and there's some the big pretty section at the far end. So please join us in that from 5 to 6. And again, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors of this, the College of Nursing, the Family Resource Center, the Women's Resource Center, and the, the Dr. Mildred B. Erickson um, Distinguished Chair in Higher Adult and Lifelong Education. Thank you again so much for being here and Kelly and Thank you.